Okay, well, hello, everybody. Um, good evening, good morning, all the all the times, wherever you're all located today. Um, welcome to Brain Club. Um, so for those that I don't know, and I think there are a couple, a couple, a couple names look new. So welcome, well, welcome those, but well, welcome to everybody. But uh, and in particular, those who are new to Brain Club. I'm Mel Hauser. I use she they pronouns, and I am executive director at All Brains Belong. Um, so tonight we will be discussing neurodivergent work challenges. Before we get started, though, just by way of introduction, our community agreement. All forms of participation are okay here. You can have your video on or off, and even if it is on, we do not expect anything of you. We certainly don't need you to look at the camera or sit still um, and, you know, please move, fidget, stim, eat, whatever you need, and everyone is, is welcome here. And all forms of communication are welcome. You can unmute and use mouth words. You can type in the chat, whatever works for you. And because safety comes first here, um, we really want to make sure that we're, you know, explicitly affirming all, all aspects of identity and that we're respecting and protecting one another's access needs. Access needs being anything that anyone needs for full and meaningful participation. So um, what, what, uh, what that means as our group has gotten larger, um, we, we want to pay some careful attention to giving space for everyone to participate. By the way, uh, participation, um, there's no right way to participate. Um, observation is a completely valid form of participation. Um, but for those who do want to um, uh, directly contribute to conversation, either with mouth words or in the chat, we want to make sure we're giving space. Um, so um, uh, 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 that's all I have to say about that. Anyway, last thing I'll mention is that today is for education purposes only. It is not medical advice. And um, individual traumatic experiences are best processed in a therapeutic setting. Uh, Brain Club is not such a setting. Last bit of access, um, closed captioning is enabled. You just need to toggle it on at your end if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, you can click either the live transcript closed captioning icon if you see it. Otherwise, try more dot 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 and choose show subtitles. And, uh, it, and, and you can do the same thing and choose hide subtitles if you'd like to turn them off. And lastly, um, uh, we, we often tend to have a robust conversation going on in the chat. Um, I'll read out selections from the chat um, periodically as we go. Um, but the, uh, if you look on your, on your Zoom toolbar, you're looking for this speech bubble and that's how to find the chat. So we are continuing our May 2023 Brain Club theme of neurodivergent lived experiences. Um, so uh, here we go. Uh, many of you have seen this slide before, but our model here at All Brains Belong is that to do anything for the neurodivergent community, we have to do everything, which is why our programs address medical care, um, education access, um, and educational trainings for the community to uh, shift the community conversation on neurodiversity and inclusion, um, social connection, and employment. All of these things are part of well-being and health. What we know is that autistic adults are anywhere from two and a half to eight times more likely to be unemployed or underemployed. And so, so that you can see the, 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 the wide variety, but you, you, the take home point is that uh, more likely than non-autistic people to be unemployed or underemployed. 75% um, of ADHD adults experience employment related challenges. And what we know is that employment is linked with health. It's part of health. Unemployment increases the probability of developing a chronic health condition by 83%. And what we know is that um, uh, those who are unemployed versus those who are employed at any level um, uh, are experience at least twice the amount of distress. 
And when we think about the, um, you know, the, the, the financial impact, the psychological impact, there's so much of this that go that goes into this. Um, and 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 because when we think about all of the, you know, the intersectional ways in which people are marginalized and other, there's just like you just stack up all of these all of these things, and 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 it's really bad for health. What we know is that we all have access needs. We talked about this last week at Brain Club. Um, access needs anything that a person needs for full participation. And everyone has access needs. It's just that for neurodivergent people, we are more likely to have our access needs not met by the defaults of society. So when we think about what are the examples of the types of access needs that one might think about um, that, you know, that relate to, to work, um, you know, it's, it's so many different things. It's the environment, you know, sensory processing, mobility, communication, executive functioning, the way that instructions are presented or the, the, the pace, the speed at which instructions are given, activity or movement needs the style of supervision and management. I mean, it's just like so many different things. And when we think about all of the opportunities for access needs to be unmet, this is going to take a toll. Um, and while, um, you know, humans are resilient and resourceful, and while, you um, People whose access needs are not met often figure out workarounds or compensation strategies for access needs not being met. It's at a cost. It's at a huge cost. And what we don't want, we don't want the square peg that's being hammered to fit into the round hole because look what happens. You break the peg. And Steve is sharing and I absolutely agree. It's all compounded by the the work driven ethic, right? So, so you know the the the, the um, American uh, society that you're referring to, you know this 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 capitalistic, you know, urgency culture, productivity culture, um, the way that like value is ascribed to how much you produce. It's all of these oppressive systems that are further compounding the problem. I absolutely agree with that. Um, Lisa's using uh, the word merit in quotes, right? So, so um, the 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 idea that you know what you accomplish, what you produce, all of this, like this, that this is this is val this 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 is where value is derived, as opposed to you you have value simply just by being. When we think about the social model of disability, where rather than, you know, in contrast to the medical model that says that the issue is the individual, the social model of disability refers to the issue being an inaccessible world. And when people don't have their access needs met, um, uh, that's where um, we see breakdown. Um, and uh, as Steve says in the chat, if merit mattered, uh, neurodivergent people would be doing a lot better, right? It's it's so so you know when we when we think about what we really would like to see. So uh, Dr. Thomas Armstrong in the book The Power of Neurodiversity uses the term niche construction. Niche construction would be you know the idea of learning about your brain and your needs and designing a life that works for your brain. Um, we have, you know so many people are such a long ways away from niche construction. Um, Often when we ask people about their access needs, they don't know how to answer that question. Most people have not been ever asked this before. Um, and so uh, one of my favorite quotes from one of our ABB Village members is, I don't know what my needs are. I just know they're not being met. Like so profound, like, yeah, that. Um, and so, you know, when we when we think about, oh, it's it's helpful. T Tanya Tanya is saying that uh, it's not just the American society with 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 uh, these capitalistic ideals. It's very similar in Australia. Yeah, I'm I'm um, I'm 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 saddened and not surprised to hear that. So um, the idea would be that maybe rather than saying, you know, like what do you need? Maybe we work backwards. Maybe we're asking, you know, what drains my battery? And if I don't know that, maybe I wonder, well, when am I exhausted? When am I stressed? When do I shut down? When do I flip my lid? When do I doubt myself? Like, and maybe the answer to that is always. 
um, because depending on um, you know in what situations and what environments your access needs are not met, um, this may be most environments that one is in. When we think about um, uh, our original approach to talking about employment and um, accessibility, we set out to, to like the oblique angle rather than name all the things that are not working. Um, we thought, well, why don't we identify places where things are working well and bright spot those examples? And so um, uh, we, we launched this program um, a little over a year ago. Um, and, uh, and, and this is a program through which Vermont um, employees can nominate their employers who are creating environments where people with all types of brains can thrive. And I'm uh, very excited to announce the spring 2023 award winners, Perky Planet, Lawson's Finest Liquids, Three Mountain Cafe, and Seaway Car Wash and Detail Center. Um, so, um, so, so, so uh, we're, and you can, you can learn more about um, these employers on, on our website. Thanks so much for posting those, Lizzie. And what we know is that there are some predictable elements, the fundamentals of neuroinclusive workspaces um, relating to, um, essentially, these are all the, 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 this matches really closely to the examples we gave of what are some of the considerations about access needs. Neuroinclusive workspaces are thinking about the multiple different types of access needs that an employee might have and designing workplaces and workplace culture intentionally um, so that um, people with different types of access needs can pick from flexible choices about how to meet that. And for a while, um, we we because uh, you know we've been we've been having monthly neuroinclusive employment brain clubs uh, for about a year now. And um, uh, Lizzie, if you could link the um, the playlist to all the YouTube recordings of all of the past neuroinclusive employment brain clubs. You know, we we've we've really run the gamut in terms of how we've approached these conversations. We've we've had community panels of neurodivergent people talking about you know what doesn't work and what does work. Um, we've had employer panels about how they um, you know create create uh, workplaces for people to have their access needs met. We've looked at you know some of the oppressive power systems that are you know you know causing further gaps in economic and health equity. Um, we've talked about you know what actually defines a neuro inclusive workplace culture. Um, and 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 anyway, but today we're gonna do something different. We got feedback from a community member. Not everyone can work for a neuro-inclusive right spot. So what about the rest of us? How do we cope? And I thought that that was such um, thoughtful, really profound feedback of like, no, I want to, I, I, we, we need something different. We need to create something different and structure this conversation differently. Um, because, you know, when, when we're in the trenches, it can feel so isolating. And sometimes, you know, though, though, though bright spotting, I think has a really um, important role to play in terms of what we can strive for and work toward and, you know, models for um, employers to follow, um, you know, when you're in the trenches, um, it, it's, 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 it's not super helpful to hear about all the all the things that go on that you don't have access to. So thank you. Thank, I, I really appreciate appreciate this feedback. So what I want to just um, present to you as a framework before we open this for discussion. I don't know how many of you have read this book um, called Scarcity I, by, by Sendhil um, Molinatman and Eldar Shafir. Um, but I'm going to stop sharing and now I can see you again. Okay. Um, but you know, scarcity. I read a number of a number of years ago, and uh, the you know the concept is that you know when 
when you don't have your needs met, this affects thinking and acting and, and it actually leads to, to, to poor decision making and, and reduced well-being. And you know, when you think about all the essential resources, you know, whether that be physical, emotional, cognitive, spiritual, you know, your whole social support system, there's just so much scarcity out there. And you know, some of the some of the, the things this book talks about is that, you know, when you when when you have scarcity, um, it's, it's predictable that that will become the primary focus of, of, of one's existence. And it makes it really hard to concentrate on, 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 on anything else, even, even, even important other things else. And it's like the, the scarcity creates really a cognitive tunneling effect where, 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 where we're fixated on, 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 on having that particular need met. Um, and, and that leads to getting stuck um, uh, scarcity creates a pattern of getting stuck because all of one's attention and bandwidth is is consumed and doesn't and 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 and, and to the expense of, of 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 everything else. And so you know, um, and, and and what the book really talks about is how do you how do you recognize when you're in scarcity mindset? And even if you're still in a state of scarcity, can the mindset Part. Like, how do you shift from a scarcity mindset to having more bandwidth? And, um, you know, I think, I think how, how, how I'm wondering how this plays out into the neurodivergent challenges at work conversation would be, you know, can we get to a place of, if you can't have the thing, um, you know, can we, can, can, can we, can we shift anything just by knowing that you know, we're not alone. There are people who understand, you know, that, that, that you're seen, that, you know, recognized your, your, your challenges are, are, are recognized. And like being, being on this journey together, does that, does that have any impact on the experience of Scarcity, unmet access needs, all of it. What do you all think? Vicky. Thanks. Uh, I... I hope it's okay. Is it is it okay to kind of tell you something that I'm dealing with right now and, and kind of get the group's feedback? Um, because it does pertain to, to scarcity and um, employment accommodations. Sure. Thank you. Um, so I, uh, I run my own house cleaning business. It's a, just me. It's a small business. And I love my clients. I love the work and it's very, it's, it's successful enough for me. Um, gives me a lot of flexibility. The issue is that um, I have to report my income to four different agencies. And um, those agencies are based on the idea that low income people are not self-employed. So every month I have to fill out a change of employment form, um, because if your income changes by more than 10%, which mine does every month, you have to fill out a change of employment form. What makes it more difficult, because I thought, well, maybe if I just earn enough money, um, but if I lose disability status, I lose um, eligibility for my mortgage, because it, it went through that, that uh, criteria. And I don't know why, I don't know if it's autism or traumatic brain injury or PTSD, but filing the income documents is not something I seem to be able to do. Um, I've been, I've gone to um, Capstone and the Vermont Brain Injury Alliance and HireAbility and CVMC Social Services, um, looking for anyone that can help me just file my income. Um, I can't find anyone. And I've been looking for a long time. And now I'm facing the idea that maybe I have to stop working, not because I can't work, but because I can't keep up with 
the regulations of the benefits. So I, I hope that's not derailing things too much. I just, um, I thought if anyone would, would know, uh, have any advice, it, it, it might be this group. Yeah, this is, and, and so while, while you were sharing, Vicki, just a lot of, a lot of, a lot of people nodding along with various components of that, like you're, you're not, you're not alone by any, any means. And, and uh, just as Laura says in the chat, what a very, very broken system. I just, um, I'm, and, I'm feeling a really, a lot of shame because it doesn't seem recognized that that could be an access need. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I actually asked higher ability before I started my business. I was like, I've done a few house cleaning jobs. People are asking me to do more. I'd like this to be a source of income. I don't want to declare a business unless there's support for filing. Cause I can't do that. And they said that they did have the support because I think they really honestly believe that they did. Um, but they don't. So, um, yeah, I'm just, I'm facing having my disability taken away now because I can't keep up with the, the reporting. And if the disability goes away, then the mortgage, I, 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 I don't know what all, um, but it's, it's quite a bit. Yeah. All right. So, so, um, uh, Lisa, Lisa has her hand up. Let's see. Let's, let's go for it, Lisa. Um, so I can relate to what you're saying. Um, I was self-employed as a dance teacher for many, many years, and I had SSDI and had to figure out um, how to make sure then adds to its own train wreck, right? And then, um, but what I ended up doing because my file was like, and they're like, yeah, we don't, we don't, we don't fit in the system. Um, I just kept track myself eventually and would give them um, the information kind of in a chunk. And if I knew that I was going to owe them something, I would have it saved to the side and then just give it to them because every time I entered something, it flagged their system and you get sent a million things. So I'm not sure it's the best thing, but it's kind of what I ended up doing. So. Nightmare. And so, you know, here, here we are having people not have their access needs met who are having to then spend all of the, all, like all this extra spoons to like navigate this nonsense. Um, uh, CB says, uh, this is so huge. I relate a hundred percent. It keeps me feeling so trapped. The disability systems are not accessible. If I work, I risk losing my shelter and medical. Right. Um, and, 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 and so many people feel, feel trapped. Um, and you know, when the, as Lisa's saying in the chat, the executive functioning demands are an issue. Like, I mean, this is, you know, I, I, I think the, the, the point that I can, that I want to, I want to zoom in on is the shame part, right? So the shame part of like, I can't do the thing where it's like the thing was thwarted. The thing was thwarted. There's nothing wrong with you that you are struggling to do the thing. Like everything you're trying to do is just being thwarted. And when, when, when coming from a place of having, you know, for all of the, 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 the old narratives um, of being uh, the, the defectiveness narrative, like it just, it, it gets brought up time and time again and recalled when things like this happen. So it's almost like, you know, how, how do we, in the setting of being thwarted, how do you recognize that you're being thwarted as opposed to blaming yourself for struggling to do the thing? What do folks think about that? How do we do that? How do we shift to recognizing and like matching the pattern of like, you know, uh, these, 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 uh, these really broken systems 
getting in the way and not that this is a reflection on your value as a human being. Yeah. I think it goes back to um, the, uh, the old fashioned mentality of how people with disabilities should be treated which is year 2023, and you know, I think, yes, we're all different individuals with our, what we're dealing with, and we're all at our levels of, uh, we're, we're all at different levels of capacities, and how we can be, how we can be in, within society, in the, in, in the community, but it's that government body or agencies making it hard just to put those, I'm just blown away. I mean, it's, you know, paperwork you have to put through. You know, I don't think Australia's got nothing. I think you just put one of the papers through, not the going to different agencies. That's, yeah, that's more like, whoa, well, okay. Yeah, so I think it's, I you think know, the old fashioned mentality has to change their thinking, the way they see it and the way that we, what we can give to the, um, to the society and the community in general. But if that ever happens, uh, just sticking it to the box. Yes. And, you know, recognizing that, you know, all human beings have value and have something to contribute to society. And it's, it's not the systems that are going to provide the way forward. The systems, you know, are designed to, to, to keep those in power and power. And, 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 and I, I actually really, I want to just zoom into to this amazing, uh, uh, Post in the chat from Allison. Um, uh, hi, Vicky. I don't know if you want suggestions or just support. Is there anyone in your life that is good at paperwork but bad at housekeeping, so you can exchange skills, right? So, so what what that what that comment means to me is it's really talking about a culture of interdependence. So this is like from the from 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 the ground up creating something new. Um, because the systems are not going to become more accessible. Um, and it's about how do we reimagine what it means to belong to community, to, 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 to not spend all your spoons on this thing that is, 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 is unfortunately the rate limiting factor to all the other things. Um, Lisa asks in the chat, when you know you're being thwarted, where do you put the anger? What do folks think about that question? Not saying it's healthy, but I always just turn the anger inward. <laughs> right. And so many people do. And yeah, I see lots of nods. Yeah. So, so many people do. Right. And, 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 and that's, that's where, um, you know, the, 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 just when you can shift from a place of blaming something, not, 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 not to say that like we go around blaming, that's not what I mean by that, but just like that you can attribute like the root, the root of a problem outside of you, as opposed to blaming yourself for the problem, like that shift is, 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 is huge. And I think I think how this 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 plays out to like our ongoing conversations around regulation is that when you are dysregulated, when your limbic system um, is triggered, um, and you're having this involuntary automatic limbic response, you may not actually have access to the the the, the cortex, the upstairs brain skills of zooming out. Zooming out is a complex brain skill. So to be able to zoom out and say, I'm, you know, this system is really messed up. Um, that's a skill you may not have access to. It's actually an executive functioning skill to be able to zoom out and, and, and recognize that you're not the problem. And so what happens is um, we, we loop into these over-rehearsed neural pathways that said, it's my fault. There's something wrong with me. Mary says, uh, anger and grief, right? So many, so many, so many complex emotions. It's all, it's all, it's all rolled up to this. And how could you not feel that way? How could you not feel that way? 
Um, uh, Sarah says, um, it, it, it seems that the shift is most definitely not linear. It goes back and forth depending on one's level of regulation, right? And how, how, what, what, what you have access to. Yes. Um, Elizabeth says, I think sometimes we have to spell out to folks exactly what we want them to do for us and tell them what has not worked in the past. I'm constantly having to, um, to, to say, I can't do that and stop people when they start explaining how to do that. Steve says, it's not that we created those patterns. We were taught in a detailed way, right? It wasn't an accident. It was like an explicit message, often in young childhood. I want to zoom back up um, to a question that was asked. Um, question, hold on, it was, I missed it. And I was like, oh, I'm going to, that sounds like a great topic. And then I got derailed. Um, so the, the question is, uh, when interviewing for a new job, how to communicate access needs or how much to communicate it first? Um, what has been, what has been folks' experiences around that? I have something to say about that, but I want to, I would love to know what, what you all think about that. Liam. My experience has, I've always been told, don't state your access needs. Like you have to make yourself look like the perfect candidate without any possible flaws or needs. It has to be entirely what you do for the company and nothing about what can help you. So, so many people are explicitly taught that. What do you think the long-term impact is of um, uh, entering into environments where it's not okay to talk about your access needs? How does that play out? Well, fortunately, I've been lucky to, in my short experience of employment, I've always, I've always worked through higher ability where the access needs are brought up at the table. Right. So I yes. don't really know what it's like, but I guess that it's really not helpful. It probably leads to a lot of stress and, yes. and probably it makes you at risk for losing your job. Yes. All of that, Liam. All of that. So I think the advice of, you know, and, 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 it's, and it's hard, right? So if you are presently employed and you need income and you are not at a and your and your access needs are not being met and you're being thwarted left and right you know the, it, it it's it it's a privilege to be able to walk away from a place of employment um and even to go through the process of applying for other jobs that takes executive functioning which you may not have access to if you don't have your access needs met all day and your battery is being constantly drained so like that's real um and if we're really talking about beginning a new employment relationship um i i think i think often in the ABB village you know when when people are of the of the viewing world through the lens of like, well, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not going to show my true self. I'm going to present, you know, the, 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 the self that I want, that I think people want to see. Um, it, it's really only a matter of time because you're set up, you present your mask and then you're like, you, 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 you um, that mask persists and the pressure to, to, to present that mask persists. And then that drains battery and it it becomes uh, and and like Mary's saying, burnout from masking, overstimulation. Um, I never knew why I couldn't handle what others could. I could pretend for a time, but the older I got, the harder it became. And and often it's not even about age. It's about you know um, time spent in burnout. Um, it's 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 you can you only have a certain amount of bandwidth and energy, and when you spend it. Um, it's it's like your it's like your car, right? Like when you run out of gas, you can't drive anymore. It's like that.
I love this lovely conversation in the chat. Like this is what this is this is this is, and I, I forget who said it. I, I missed I missed the line about you know a, a community that takes care of itself. Like this is a this is a place to make connections, and you know there 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 are um an, um you know when 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 again we're not going to likely um uh, fix the structural problems and systems, um, we can very much find people who get it um, and, you know, to, 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 to try to devise, you know, some, some, some creative workaround. And bartering skills, um, like Mary said, bartering skills amongst ourselves is a great idea. So going back to um, uh, a question I posed at, 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 at the beginning around, you know, if is, you know, it, when you don't have your access needs met, is it the case that um, all of your attention goes to getting your particular access needs met? Right. Like that's the scarcity mindset thing. Right. Like it's it's fairly I mean, this book is really well researched. Um, it's fairly predictable um, that that's going to happen. It's not like a, you know, a, 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 a character deficit. It's like a predictable human nature thing. Um, so so uh, and then and then. The stuckness. So how do we get how do how do we shift out of that when you recognize that it's happening? Because it's going to happen. It's going to happen to all of us. It, I mean, it does happen to all of us. David. Oh, um, yeah, I thought I sent a chat text, but I'm not sure that it went through. I. For me, the discovery in being part of a group like this, uh, it's a continuing process. One of the big ones is just realizing what my access needs probably have been. I mean, I'm beyond the end of my career. and I look back on it now. And for me, it would have been, um, I know this sounds maybe a little defeatist. I wouldn't have expected most of the organizations I worked for to figure out how to meet my access needs, but I should have known better what those needs were and not gotten involved in the first place. I spent a lot of years in organizations, big bureaucracies that were not about to change their pace of way of doing things. I mean, this is sort of neurotypical dominance magnified by many times. And it just knowing what the needs are and then for being very clear on which, which organizations are likely to meet them or not, being being just sort of um, humble about what you can expect to do within an organization that is not about to listen very carefully. Um, other people have talked in here in previous sessions about trying to point out things that were problems within an organization where, the, where people just didn't want to hear that. And maybe eventually they would catch up and realize what was going on. Um, but it's awfully tough to be there in the meantime when people aren't realizing that. So for me, it's just that sense of being very clear on what, who I am and what my needs are and, and what kind of organization would work for that. Um, this has been terrific. I wish I had been here 50 years ago. <laughs> right, and like there's, there, there's, there's so much, um, you know, like, and, and, and I just wanna say like you, you couldn't, have received this message 50 years ago, right? Like, so you, all of us, right? We can only, you know, like if, if, if you're not surrounded by community that get it, um, if you're the only one who has a certain framework, like you're not, you're not, you're not going to be able to shift the paradigm of like, you know, of, of, of how you, you know, re, re, even describe your own experience. Laura. Um, David, that just really resonates with some of my own experiences and recognizing where we can make change and where we can't. And then like Mel, I think you're such the role model of leaving and doing your own thing when you can't change the system. Um, but 
one thing that strikes me is that um, I had an experience of applying for a job that was not my dream job that I didn't, it was kind of like, win me over. If I'm going to take this job, you've got it. And it was such a different experience than any other job I'd ever applied for where I really wanted it. And I wanted to portray myself this certain way that I thought was very hireable. And it actually was such a great learning experience to feel like I had this power seat of like, these are my conditions. Do they work for you or not? Because that's what I need to work here. Um, And in some ways, I think just having that experience of the not dream job application was really um, empowering in future application processes for myself. And knowing that negotiation power that you have to, I think that's a privilege to hold that power, but um, to be able to learn the skill of saying like, I'm interviewing you as much as you're interviewing me. And this has to be a fit for me to make sense. Yes, absolutely. And um, when when people have received the message that you don't get to have needs, um, that you are needy if you get to have needs, like how on earth would we get to a place where we can enter a, a job situation to say, you know, oh, I have needs, I'm interviewing the employer, like, like that's just so unlikely. Um, when you're when you're in that state, and I think that you know when what 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 the other thing that came to mind when 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 David was sharing is just the idea of safety, right? So you could be entering a job interview and get like the red flag, like eh, like radar vibes, and if you don't trust your intuition, because when you know you've been you'd have been told that you're overreacting or you've been told you're too sensitive or you've been told you're making a big deal about things when you don't have that intuition of like, Ooh, I'm getting a, I'm getting a vibe here that like, doesn't feel like I can show up as my true self or like, you know, I feel unsafe with these people in this environment, like, or, or I'm supposed to feel that way because it's new. I'm supposed to feel that way because it's a job interview. Like there's all these narratives that make people discount their own experience. Um, Sarah says, reminds me of interviewing healthcare providers for myself uh, when they were pregnant. It made me really feel like the provider was a good match for me. Right. And I think that, um, you know, uh, when, when we are meeting um, people um, in whether in a, in a professional context or personal context, there's a there's a difference, I think, between um, the like being able to show up authentically versus not. And I think that Um, people, if they have not, if they're not used to feeling safe in community, um, they don't expect to feel safe. And so if something feels unsafe, it's like, oh, well, that's how life feels. And so people end up in employment situations where, you know, things go south. And and if you ask people like, you know, did you, did you have any warning signs of this? Almost always they did. Um, but they, you know, they, 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 they didn't, they didn't know that they could discern safe from not safe. Steve says, I was a manager, a school principal. I valued my uh, neurodivergent employees, the students, 30% or more were also uh, neurodiverse. I, I did everything I could to make it work for them, but there, there are also incredible barriers for even well-intentioned managers. And you know, you're listing listing all of the all of the barriers. There's just so many. Um, so so yes. Um it's it's, 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 it's very hard. Um, and I mean, I can, I can, I can say, and like, I've, I've, I'm really new to being an employer. Um, and I really, um, it's like really important to me to be a neuroinclusive employer. Um, and, um, we have, we, we have, you know, as a, as a, as a small, enterprise, we have the flexibility to like be responsive and nimble and make changes to make sure everyone's access needs are being met. And in a, in a, in a, in a big enterprise, there are lots of systemic barriers. Um, and I cannot imagine, um, you know, I, 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 I cannot imagine being thwarted, um, by the system for how to meet 
people's access needs that I was responsible for. Like that, that is just an, un, you know, what, what Steve is describing is just, I mean, this is how it is. This is how it is for a lot of people. So it's like, it begins with a paradigm shift and it also like comes down to autonomy and agency um, to actually do the right thing. Oh, sorry. I uh, think, thank, thank, thank you, Sarah, for bringing to my attention. I'm sorry, Lisa, for not seeing your hand. Go for it. That's okay. It was just uh, when you're talking about the red flags and things, it really reminds me of the same kind of thing with trauma or when you are just used to being on hypervigilant mode and, and that's normal, right? And um, there's nothing else. And so if you don't know anything else, then you're just like, yeah, this relationship or this job or this lifestyle, this is what it is. And it's just that I'm bad at it. Not that this just made me think of it's kind of that way, I guess. Yeah. And if we're, I'm looking for a visual support. So whether we're talking about, you know, trauma, like macro trauma, um, or, you know, micro trauma of everyday life, this is a really good book called sensory trauma, um, autism, sensory differences and the daily experience of fear. Um, so trauma physiology, um, stays in, in, in the body. Right. And, and, and I think that, um, you know, it's, uh, it, 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 those over-rehearsed neural pathways, like the brain is changed. Um, and, and, uh, you know, we, 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 in many ways often, um, you know, gravitate toward what is over-rehearsed. Um, Aiden says, anyone else noticed a lack of flexibility on neurodiversity, especially in the mental and mental health field, or is it me? Oh, yeah, for sure. Right. So, so, uh, and, 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 and this also comes to, I mean, it, it comes to training and we talk a lot about, um, you know, brain rules versus world rules. And by brain rules, I don't mean the, like the brain rules book about how to get your brain to work better. I mean, like the, the, the rules that seem like they are like universal life truths, but your brain really made them up or like someone else's brain made them up and like you got brainwashed into them. Anyway, there are so many brain rules in the healthcare system, in the medical education system. Like I was literally, I mean, I can say that because I like was trained in the traditional healthcare system, right? Like, I mean, I was literally trained that there's one right way to be a person. Um, there's one right way to develop. There's one right way to like communicate and play and, you know, all the things, right? And it's just, it's, it's just wrong. Yes, I will look for the link for the book I talked about for sure. But, but And that's where, to Aiden's point, I think when you can recognize that a system um, is really messed up um, and that it's not, it's not you, that, that's huge. Oh, thank you, Laura. Thank you for supporting my executive functioning. I have the kind of brain that's so hard to like think and talk and like open up a web browser. Thank you. So what have we not addressed tonight that I that 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 we think would be important to name around employment, whether that be, you know, um, ways, ways of coping, ways of getting unstuck, ways of connecting with community, ways of just, you know, uh, just just uh, re reframing the experience of being in the trenches. Somebody, somebody said in a long ago brain club that if you're stuck in work that it isn't working that you have basically you can either accept what's going on you can change what's happening you can try to create something new or you can leave and what struck me going through that list was when i realized that i was really stuck and that it wasn't going to change and that my excess needs weren't going to be met but I couldn't really leave because I had you know, children to take care of in schools and things like that. Um, it was just a really debilitating experience. I did, learned a lot about burnout um, and just the energy that goes into not having a, an exchange with your work environment of having this sort of wall placed uh, is very, very exhausting. and. I don't know. I said that's why I said <clears throat> I think it's really important to 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 start the trajectory of work with a as clear as 
possible a sense of you know what your what your dream job actually is your dream job is not necessarily the one you think it is because you th you think that you can move into a situation and you can bring what you are to that situation there are a lot of jobs that are just not going to not going to hear you so the dream job is one that is a keen awareness of your own access needs and a keen awareness of what an organization is going to be able to do with them absolutely um uh recently um uh our uh, co-chair of our board um inter we, 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 we were going to actually play it tonight but it, I didn't, it didn't this seemed like this should this conversation framed this way was going to be more more useful um but uh matt interviewed me about um about, about work um and like my own working experiences and how this compared to other things and anyway how the conversation evolved was really interesting is I was giving examples of like as a as a child growing up anytime I felt unsafe I would just like cut people off like oh you're an unsafe person cut you off like as a third grader like I just anyway so that to be in a work situation where I was stuck I'm the primary breadwinner um I can't leave it's like it's 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 unsafe I don't have my access needs met and to not be able to leave I mean that I've never experienced anything like that in my entire life. And I had no frame of reference for it. Um, and that drove me further into autistic burnout than anything. I mean, I, I, I anyway, that's how I got my autism diagnosis. Um, but it was it was that experience of stuckness. Um, and so, you know, yeah, we talk about like, you know, yeah, I had a you know a place of privilege of being able to you know, leave a leave leave an environment that wasn't a fit for my needs, and you know all this. But like, for 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 a year and a half, um, at least, um, of like this, like like not only are my access needs not being met, but I am unsafe. Um, that that is how so many people feel. Lisa says, um, or sorry, I'm scrolling up. CB says, I end up using my time with my therapist to help me with the completing paperwork for executive functioning stuff. Right. Yeah. Culture of interdependence. Um, Sarah says, so well put, David. I agree. Lisa says, I, I think neurodivergent brains have a lot to offer. And if we can get the support or if we can put ourselves in the best environment possible, we can be able to contribute more. Right. Um, and 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 uh, yes. And Steve, Steve is amazed at, at, at the language that you're learning here. Tanya. I'm talking about thinking, guys, back off, I think the majority of you will agree with me that they tend to look at their disability first before us able to do the, the work at hand or the job criteria at hand. Because there's a lot of stigma around the disability, like with autism. And because I'm also, I'm not only that I'm born with brain damage, but two bad genetic brain disorders. and and more I'm autistic when I was three years old, technically, guys, I did, I, I, I did die twice my first three months of life back in the day, you know, but we, we're so much able-bodied people that can do, we can, we, we're able to do things that we can to our level of capacity. But then when it comes to a job provider or seeing as some, you know, going for a job, we have to really work very hard to be at that level, the same as normal people. Well, there's nothing normal, but you know, we have to we have to put our we have to put ourselves right at the forefront. But then we're trying, you know, we challenge, I always challenge myself and you know, it doesn't get me far. You know, even though I've ne I've, I've never actually worked myself except for having my three children and stuff. And yeah, that's Working yeah. itself, <laughs> yeah. But I also, I, but I also found my two identities later in life that was kicking the guts, which I was born into this world with this. But I had to take myself off the mantelpiece and realize that I can only do what I can do. But I can, yeah. You know, I can also, you know, I can catch up with the other things. So it's. It has not been an easy world for some of us where we have to um, really I don't know, double check on how, on how we have to do things. 
we have to be more than ourselves sometimes. That it's it's not it's okay if it's you know if we're not going right. We're not going to do things what we mentally supposed to be doing, but we also have to look after ourselves in our mind in a way that every day tomorrow, yeah, we just have to do what we need to. Yes. Thank you, Tanya. And, you know, I think that all anyone can do is do what they can do. Um, And I think that when society gives people the message that you're supposed you're supposed to do a certain amount of thing and that you're supposed to do more than you can do and that there's like a gold standard of what it means to do like that. That's just so bad for health. Um, and I, and I, and I, and I think that, um, you know, that, that, that ableism of the, you know, this, all of the messages that, that, um, that it is superior to be able to do the thing and to do more than the thing. And I think that, you know, there's, there's, it's, it's, it's just so bad for health. I'm reading a quote in the chat from from Steve, who's quoting Ben Mitchell. Um, uh, people in the autism community are most likely to be targeted when you so- struggle with social pragmatics or so- processing speed. You're at the mercy of anyone with even a minimal level of social status, um, and and uh, I, I and they come to a point where they can no longer endure the constant humiliation patronizing from neurotypical culture, right? And so I think that, um, again, normalizing safety and normalizing that all people deserve to show up as their true selves and to feel safe in community as their true selves, um, you know, rather than, you know, um, you know, I, I think I, 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 I think that, that that message is not arguable. <laughs> like, so, so I, I, uh, I, 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 I think that, um, you know, e- e- uh, anyway, and, and also I think it's really important to shift the narrative of like what kids grow up thinking, even, you know, kids with typically developing brains. Um, I like to talk about neurodiversity with, I don't want anybody thinking that their brain is the default brain because it's just not true. There is no default brain. Um, we all do things differently. But most of all, Mel, it's the respect that we that we should that we that we should be given. We sometimes we don't get the right respect of who we are. It always goes back to that that word, that disability, or that payment that we're, we're dealing with. But yeah, you know, this we are who we are. This is who we are. But why can't they see us as what we what we can do? It's not what we can't do. Right. the federal governments too. <laughs> right. So the sh- a strength a strength based lens is 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 critical. And uh, as we wrap up today, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna read uh, what Elizabeth's posted in the chat, um, and I'll connect it to a to 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 the, to the bigger picture. So Elizabeth says something that's promising for me is the norm around personal boundaries that appears to be shifting um, even amongst neurotypicals. I'm Gen X, and we'll put up with crap in a workplace. The millennials and Gen Z in my department say no to things. They also quit when their needs aren't met. I'm seeing turnover among new hires in my workplace, and I'm thinking our management is starting to notice they don't get a one sided seat of power anymore. So say, so all people need to be able to say, to, to, to say no. And I think when we think about, you know, we think about young children, um, this is where this begins. Like you have to practice saying no and to feel safe saying no. And that, and, and so for so many of us as adults, we're learning this for the first time and we're having to, you know, unlearn all of these messages that say that like, you know, the, the, the brain rules that say that you can't say no, you, you, Right. So, so anyway, that, but I also just want to say, um, you know, when we think about, um, you know, how, how, why does conversations around neurodiversity and access are so mission critical is that, you know, we have, we're, we're at a place where there's so many, um, you know, employers who are, you know, they can't fill positions, they can't keep employees, there's so much turnover. It's like, well, did you think if you met people's access needs, they might not quit their jobs, right? Like, so, so that's, I think, how this really does benefit everyone to be having these conversations around access needs. 
And so, uh, so, so, you know, when, when we do a lot of neuro inclusive employment trainings for employers who are looking to, you know, improve their, the way that they meet people's access needs. And I think that so much of this is, is it's a paradigm shift. It's like, yeah, we teach people practical things that they can do to incorporate universal design principles into everyday life. But this really is, you, you just like, you got to shift to recognize that we all have different brains. And if you want people with all different types of brains to be able to access employment, you have to offer everything you're doing in multiple different ways. So there's that. So thank you all so much for this, um, as always, this wonderful conversation. Um, thank you to everyone who shared their experiences and, and, and ideas. And thank you all so much for being part of our community. And we'll see you next week. Uh, we have a community panel on uh, experiences of neurodivergent parents. Um, so we will see you then. Have a great week. Bye, everybody.